posted by Wednesday. It should be posted by Wednesday or Thursday of this week. Today's class is offered to the general public from the BYU Family History Library, and our presenter is Elder James Tanner. He has a wonderful, extensive background of research and family history. If you haven't joined one of his classes today, up to date, you're in for a treat. And if you have, welcome back. So Elder Tanner, we'll turn the time over to you. Hey, great. And I will share my screen. Okay, here we go. Today, this is going to be interesting. Um, we're going to talk about the history of families, the familysearch.org website, and um, probably give you some insight into the history of how all of this, all these collections of genealogical records um, were accumulated. And it's from 1999 to 2022. Um, I'm going to, I'll remind at the end of the, the, the uh, presentation, but the images that I've got here are screenshots from the original websites. That means the websites as they looked in those years. And we'll start off with the, the years that are um, basically shown on the screen. And um, I'll have some discussion about what happened and what kinds of collector records are available. I am not unaware that this is that anything like this has been done previously. Uh, there are some good articles, uh, good historical articles, and there's uh, lots of other material online that you can use to kind of put this together. But uh, the images that I'm showing here come from the website, the Internet Archive, or archive.org. That's A-R-C-H-I-V-E without an S, dot O-R-G. And they have what's called the Wayback Machine. And what they have, what it, that is, is a um, archive of websites um, going back to almost the origin of the internet. And so if what you do, uh, you have to know the, the address, the URL of the website to do the search. It's, there's a hard way to get into it any other way. But if you happen to have an, a website like familysearch.org, you can put that in and they will then they have then uh, preserved screenshots and of the website at various times, and so I have extracted those uh, screenshots from archive.org in order to put all this together to show how the website was developed. Okay, so we'll jump into it. Uh, important thing to start out with is to understand the original record sets that were used by family search and accumulated uh, electronically in the in the computer world when they began to uh, put computerize the records that they had uh, accumulated beginning going back in time uh, a quick kind of summary and about Two sec three few seconds is that Family Search originated as the Genealogical Society of Utah in 1894, and they immediately began to accumulate records. And I did a presentation just recently about that part of the history. And then uh, in 1938, they began a worldwide effort to digit to uh, microfilm records. And those microfilm records accumulated until we there were 2.4 million rolls of microfilm. And I'll just go once I get to that position, uh, I'll pick up I'll pick up with the, the history. But the original record sets that that were accumulated by Family Search uh, was a digit was a digital record called the ancestral file, and it's still around. You can still look at it. It's it's available under the the section on familysearch.org that says um, genealogies. So if you go to the search menu and the, and the third item, I think, or so is genealogies. That includes a lot of different, uh, some of the older uh, original databases 
that they have. So if you want to go back and look at all those original databases, go to that genealogies under the search tab on familysearch.org. The, the ancestral file was a compilation of pedigrees and family group records. The family group records were the paper records of individual family groups and the pedigrees were the paper records of the, of the families put together. And those records had been submitted over since the original records went into the uh, Genealogical Society of Utah in, back in 1894. So there's this huge pile. And what it, there was a, an extraction, meaning they copied those records, typed them all into the computer. And so the, the ancestral file is essentially a, a copy of uh, a compilation of, of user submitted uh, records. And the, the side note on this is that there was a tremendous amount of duplication. Uh, if I submitted a record and all of my ancestors, uh, excuse me, all my relatives submitted records over the years, there was a new copy for every, every time that happened. And so you can begin to understand that this pile of records was, uh, is, is in a partially valuable because it began so long ago that the information that is contained in the, the ancestral file is in some cases firsthand. In other words, I was when I put it in, I put in my information and my parents' information, and that's the information that I knew. So that may be valuable information, but, and I'm gonna to have to swing ahead really far to do this, but when they established the, the, up, the, up to the current time, all of the information in the ancestral file is in the family search family tree. There is nothing in that file that will be new. It's old records. Now, what if you wanted to view the original paper records? Well, those are in what's called the um, is they're on they're in uh, on family search also. There's digitized copies of millions and millions and millions of of family group records, and you can go through that. It's the family group records on, and that one is in the catalog. So you have to go look for family group records. The easiest way to find this information, by the way, is to use the Family Search Research Wiki and look for um, the original records for Family Search, and that will and that'll give you where they all are and how they were formed. Now the next one was the International Genealogical Index. Now this was a different kind of record. This was a, the process starting back in the 1960s to extract information from original records that, that were on microfilm or um, available. And the IGI as it's known is also a basis when you, and uh, the primary areas where it was extracted was from Mexico, England, which was the biggest collection and a few from other places, including the United States, but not the bulk of these records are from England. And they, they are birth, marriage and death records, unfortunately extracted at different times. So you have a birth record, but you have, do not have the accompanying parents record. You have a marriage record, but you don't have any of the children's records and you have a death record, which doesn't contain anything except the death. So the International Genealogical Index, as you're working your way back through uh, family search, uh, it is very common for you to find uh, a record that has been added from the International Genealogical Index. So if you go to your sources and say there's four or five sources, you can open those up. If you look at those, you'll examine it. It's very common that you'll find a record that was taken from the International Genealogical Index. Now, obviously, you don't go to the Genealog International Genealogical Index, just like the ancestral file, to look for more information about your family because all of that's already in the family tree. So if you are going back in your genealogy, uh, you'll simply be duplicating records if you start pulling them out of the ancestral file or the International Genealogical Index as you will with the pedigree resource file. Now, this is a completely different kind of record. It was a record that we'll talk, I'll talk about a little bit as we go through the history. 
But basically what this is, is records that were submitted and uploaded in the form of GEDCOM or Genealogical Data, Data Communications Program records into uh, a big database that they're calling the pedigree resource file. And as a matter of fact, the pedigree resource file is still alive, still going, and you can still upload your, your um, records by GEDCOM file to FamilySearch if you wish to have them preserved. Once again, this is records that have been smorted, uh, uh, submitted by users. Uh, they may or may not have original uh, source material. Uh, they're kind of records that we say could be valuable, but please pr uh, uh, proceed with uh, caution and uh, don't believe anything you see unless it has a valid source and you look at the valid source because these records are just simply uh, original records. The reason I say that is because I, I contributed two uploads to the pedigree resource file very, very early in my research. And I can tell you, I have spent the last 40 years correcting all that information. And so I would hate for anybody to pull up my records and try to copy them because you would find out that I'd probably changed it all, not all, but a significant portion of it. Others are mis uh, membership lists from the 1800s to the present of those people who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as well as the temple records, all of these of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, all of these records, this, these five sets of records were accumulated separately and then became over time incorporated into the familysearch.org website and uh, were all of these were ultimately the basis of the family search family tree. So this is kind of the seed information that you're going to find as you get into uh, the familysearch.org website. Now, important to understand that the development of this website closely follows the advances in technology, including the expansion of the internet. This is this is the kind of the core challenge. And, and uh, uh, if people over time have complained, oh, this changes, oh, this is different, oh, this comes up, oh, they've got a new thing here, this is, oh, I have to change, I have to learn this. The answer is this, not a, this is an ongoing pro, uh, issue. It will continue to change. It will continue to get new features. It will uh, advance uh, the, uh, before we started the recording here, we were talking about the images section on family search and on the familysearch.org website. And that that's just kind of a that is a classic illustration of what happens when you begin accumulating records and uh, you have to have all of those records processed. The processing of the records, even if in your own personal research, takes uh, the bulk of all the time that you spend. Uh, finding the records is the challenge. Processing the records and making them usable and extracting all of the information of those records becomes the major challenge. Okay, so here we are, the 8th of May of 1999. This is the original st uh, startup screen, homes page, whatever you want to call it, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, the familysearch.org website as it appeared online. Uh, at this time, uh, let's see, in 1999, um, I was, let's see, time. Now, it's, it was, uh, it's pretty close. I have been working as a uh, church service missionary volunteer for uh, Family Search in the family history libraries and uh, family history centers for now for 18 years. And so it was just before that, but I was already on computers. I, I began to get on the computers and began uh, digitize, not digitizing, but yeah, I started digitizing as soon as they invented scanners. But I uh, began to uh, enter the, my genealogical information back uh, after I got the first computers, and that would have been around uh, 1982, 83. 
So that's when I began the process of, um, of 40 years ago. And that was all on computers. I, 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 never, <laughs> I never did anything on, on, a, uh, on paper that I recall. Uh, I've started out by just entering it in immediate, as soon as the programs and the processes were available, I was entering stuff. And I remember immediately that the, I knew just sort of through the grapevine that uh, familysearch.org website had gone up online. And uh, the first week, by the way, it came online on 8 May. And by the end of that week, it had crashed completely. The, the, the response was so overwhelming for the, the capabilities of the internet and, the, and all of the equipment that we had back in 1999 that it couldn't stay online. So they had to redo it. And when they finally released it, uh, it, it did stay online, but you would often run into the fact that it would not, not respond because the, the abuse was far, far exceeded the ability of uh, the technology at the time. And that's one thing that's important to understand about family search. Uh, despite, you would think, conservative nature of, of that kind of an organization, uh, they have been at the absolute cutting edge, pushing it constantly to, uh, to develop uh, products and uh, services that enable uh, people to do their family history. Uh, so if you look down the side over there, you'll see uh, you can search for ancestors, which meant you could search uh, if you followed. And here's the other thing that happened back in 1999. All of those databases that I talked about were available uh, in digital format on compact disk. So you had, a, uh, if you went to a family history center, basically what the familysearch.org website would do would give you access to maybe one or two of those, those databases and primarily indexes. And then you would have to go to a family history center to get the, the information off of, of a CD like the IGI, the International Genealogical Index. And uh, until, mm, well, it's been a, quite a few years now, but it wasn't too long ago that the family history centers had uh, microfiche copies of the IGI that you could go search through. Uh, so the transition from the microfilm microfiche industry uh, really began in earnest on May 8th of 19, 1999. And um, this was very early in the world of online genealogy, by the way. There were a few what you would call list serves that were on the old internet and uh, other, other types of things that you could do, but there wasn't a lot more that you could, you could do searching outside of uh, coming to family search. And I'm, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to have comparable timelines. A program, a, a website like uh, uh, MyHeritage has only been around for less than 20 years. And so there's uh, a lot of this has happened in, not only in the lifetime of, of us old guys, but within the lifetime of, of people who are considerably younger. If you look over on the left-hand side, you'll see there's a way to preserve your genealogy at, at a, a site, uh, order family history resources. And uh, at this point, uh, almost everything about family search was uh, controlled and, and, uh, and had notices about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And you'll see the copyright at the bottom was by Intellectual Reserve, which was uh, the corporation for the church. And so um, uh, the idea of uh, familysearch.org being an organization and family search being a separate organization just simply uh, was not, was in the process of being formulated at that time. And so we're kind of growing up with that. So now, uh, the new thing here, when we got up to October, was tips on how to search for your ancestors. Now, you'll see that there are ancestor searches uh, as you go across the screen, the ancestral file, the IGI, and those were it, and websites by name, by last name only. Uh, and and the only areas that were available were British Isles, North America, and Finland. 
Okay, so that was back in 1999. Um, and you could begin your search. Um, at this point, actually, uh, the, the time that I had spent previous to this, back into the 1980s, uh, compiling my own genealogy was, uh, had become uh, extremely much, uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, sped up. <laughs> They've become accelerated uh, immeasurably. Uh, I spent almost 15 years looking through paper at the, at the uh, Family History Library in Salt Lake City, finding and trying to accumulate all of the information about my family. Uh, once that was digitized and put into the ancestral file and able to be searched, I was, I could have done that in a matter of a few months. Today, with the family search family tree, you can determine the same amount of information that's been submitted and available in a matter of a very short time. I would assume, I would think that my um, uh, efforts, if I were starting out from zero today and it was still my own family, my family, you would have back six generations or more uh, in almost as fast as you could click. So you just really have to, this is the part of this is to appreciate the, not just the changes, but the advantages that we have walking into uh, these massive programs, uh, online website programs. <clears throat> Okay, so now they were talking about collaborating with others, uh, still talking about preserving your genealogy, which, by the way, was not uploading it to anything. It was simply talking about how you preserved the records that you had and which you kept. Uh, so this is before any of that was happening. So here's the categories that, uh, uh, if you from the west left side there. So you can see that there was um, there were things that you could do. Uh, to uh, to get involved and get involved in line, but it was uh, extremely limited. By the year 2000, you can see that the uh, there's a couple of things marked new. You can search, you can search by an event and a year range, and you can uh, click to use exact spelling if that's what you wanted to search by. Um, the searches were rudimentary. Uh, you may or may not find what you're looking for, but that didn't usually mean anything much. Uh, from the search standpoint, just as it is today, the searches produce a lot more uh, closely close names than they were. They were very unsophisticated. And so you're not likely uh, to find your person, uh, especially just using a, a name of a first and last name and a parent's name. Uh, and a spouse's name any more than you are today. So uh, yes, the uh, searches have been updated uh, considerably. So this was uh, basically here was adding in a way uh, to preserve your genealogy. Uh, that was, that's always been a concern that you preserve your genealogy. And the preserving process that we have today is to enter your information into the family search family tree, add sources, which documents the information out to historical records. And then the third part of that is memories where you can upload uh, photos and, and uh, digitized documents and audio files and stories, text files. So all of this helps to preserve your genealogy. And one thing that's the underlying all this is the extraordinary efforts that FamilySearch has made over the years to keep all this information online in a, in, and preserve it. Um, online preservation is a challenge just like preservation of paper or any other kind of preservation work. So this was a, a, great, a great stride forward in helping uh, to help preserve your genealogy. Um, so by March 20th, March 1st of 20, 2000, uh, of the year 2000, 
they had added that you can now search the pedigree resource file uh, with an index. Uh, that would um, that was somewhat helpful, and basically the compact you had to go to the compact disk version to still get more family information. So if you if you were living in a place where you could get to the uh, a, a family history search family history center, and uh, that the numbers were were limited at the time then you would, uh, you would be able to, to quickly go through the, you could go into the compact disc version. And uh, there were some, type, some family history centers had compact disc versions. That was probably the hallmark of being a family history center, which by the way, family history center started in 1962 and the Brigham Young University Family History Library that was in the origin in 1962, the first family history center for uh, family search and for the church. Okay, so now you can have uh, view a list of all the GEDCOM files you've submitted. So if you wanted to go in and look and see what you'd uploaded to the pedigree resource file, you could see your list. And there was now a free download of personal ancestral file which was the family search uh, first uh, uh, digital online, not online, but digital desktop program for entering information. Mm. I'm not going to say much about first ancestral file today because that's a whole nother subject. And uh, suffice it to say, personal ancestral file has been completely abandoned by family search. It is no longer supported. And uh, as we, as I kind of monitor that situation, it is rather not in your interest, preservation interest, to try to keep uh, an old personal ancestral file. Um, and then there are cap, uh, the regions uh, from the International Genealogical Index had been added. Um, I would just a comment is that, that all of that information, as I mentioned just a moment ago, it ha has been incorporated into uh, the, the records and the, the family search family tree. So it's just not, there's no original information there that, that there was original information, that there's no supplemental information in the IGI that will help you. You just need to get busy looking at other records and working on the family search family tree. And as you enter an individual, it's very likely if there was an entry from the International Genealogical Index that you will find it as a, as a uh, duplicate. And as you merge it, you will get the source from the IGI. So that's where that comes from. Uh, now you could, at this point in 2000, you could view the microfilms listed in the Family History Library catalog. So they had, had put on, um, uh, had entered uh, and created a family, the family history library catalog and put that online. And so there's, uh, you know, we began the process of, of making that huge catalog available. And there's all sorts of little detail things that they could do like uh, adding additional search terms, uh, making it easier to search for the children of the same parents. Um, there's a lot of references back and forth about uh, index, IGI index batch and film numbers and uh, microfilm numbers. All of these records go back into the issue of when we were accumulating the records. So let's get moving here. Uh, so here's kind of the, the, what I just had gone through, give you a summary of uh, some of the things that showed up back in 2000. Now, when you get into um, the question of uh, some of the changes that were made on November 9th of 2000, there was a substantial change. All of a sudden, color, there's, you know, it starts to look like uh, a designed um, basically design uh, website. And there's lots more links and information. 
but in the core of the information that that would be useful for doing research, not much that not much changed. Uh, there were just what we would call those are continued modifications. And so when you get up to 2001, you can see there's the, uh, design wise, uh, what's on the page, uh, in this case, in, in 2001, another CD-ROM collection was made available, and that was the Freedmen's Bank records for the freed uh, enslaved people at the end of the Civil War who were involved in the Freedmen. Now, the Freedmen Bank records and all the Freedmen's records uh, have been digitized, put online, and they're available on multiple websites, including FamilySearch. And that's the current status of those records. But here you can see uh, back there 22 years ago, 21 years ago, that uh, uh, these records were beginning to be uh, put online and, and made available. Uh, here's some statistics from 2001. Oh. oh, looks like they didn't, my PowerPoint collapsed. So let me go back into it. Sorry, folks. I probably have to share it again. That's weird. I don't usually get whatever. That's been the first time I've gotten a PowerPoint problem. Let's see, I'm gonna to have to kind of go through here real fast. Okay, we're back to Friedman's records. I hope it doesn't collapse again. Let's see if it's going to, nope. Okay, so here's some statistics from back then. Uh, the number of names, uh, number of hits, uh, number of visitors, uh, when you see, when they talk about number of names, and that's like 887 million names, there are probably that many names in, uh, in one collection now on FamilySearch. The, there are billions and billions of names uh, with billions of records. And so it's just, it's, uh, there's just no way of, of thing. And you can see back then there were, uh, uh, about 664,000 registered users. Now there's like 14 million registered users. So th this is this way it was started here was, uh, was very, very uh, rudimentary. So from 2002 until 2005, there were no major website changes. Nothing happened except a continual addition of records that uh, were, were being added to the website. But you'll see still here in 2002, they're still talking about availability on compact disc. And, and so FamilySearch was essentially an adjunct to the Family History Centers where these products were, were available. And then we go from 2006, and then you see a really dramatic change. Um, part of this, comes about as um, the as the monitors, meaning the computer monitors, changed. If you if you think about what was happening during this time period, uh, the original uh, monitors were uh, low resolution, and as the resolution got higher and uh, more color monitors were available, uh, then uh, there was more space for putting in pictures and and. Uh, and adding in all sorts of, of information. You'll see that PATH was in color. Uh, there were, uh, there's the Family History Library catalog. Now we have census collections from US, British and Canadian censuses. And so the, there, the website itself did not change visually much, but uh, there were still records being added uh, and a lot of uh, very interesting records. Now we come to a kind of what I would call a monumental point in the development of the Family Search website. That is, the Family Search Research Wiki was seeded with about 800 articles on December 14, 2007. By this time, I can tell you I was online constantly. 
In other words, it was it was just became that was when it be by this time it had become uh, like the main part of my life outside of my job as a trial attorney and uh, and my other obligations and family and whatever. But this was my major focus um, of what I did. And I knew about the wiki like within a week. Uh, they didn't have any real way of, of publicizing these kinds of things, but I picked it up. And I had been very much aware of and had, uh, had been working with wikis, uh, such as Wikipedia and some of the other big online databases that were developing and uh, doing research. And because of that, I got involved with the research wiki almost. I think it was within one or two weeks I was in there. And the point of this was that users could go in and add information. And one of the comments that I get from time to time is that people say, well, I wish I could take all this stuff in your head and dump it into mine. And I went, well, I don't think you'd want that. But um, I would, at this point during this period of time, I would say, use the research wiki because me, my, I, and many other people are spending a considerable effort uh, to, uh, to transfer everything we know about genealogy into the research wiki. And that's still going on. Uh, I, if during this period of time, the first eight years of the wiki, I met almost weekly with a, a team of researchers from the Family History Library in Salt Lake. I was living down in in Arizona, obviously, at the time. And um, I would uh, be online with them every week, and we would go through the whole process of uh, adding information to the wiki. We'd focus on certain areas and say, oh, we've got to add all this. You want to work on New York this week? OK, we need this from New York. Everybody add in all these records from New York. So the basic idea here was to build the wiki. And within a few years, it was um, uh, it had it started to grow and it uh, we will go through that real quick. So here's the revision in 2007, what had gone in. And if you want to know about the research wiki and the history of it and where it comes from and how it works, go to the research wiki because there's all the articles explaining the history from in detail. Just go there and say history wiki and you'll come up with these pages and uh, it will tell you all about how it works, where it came from, and uh, the articles that were put into the wiki. And uh, there's revisions that were being done uh, and uploaded every day. There were, there were just a multitude of problems we had to face, like copyright problems and issues with people who had who claimed ownership of information that they really didn't own it, and on and on. And it was kind of a, a week. A weekly project. Uh, and that hasn't stopped. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've spent every week uh, meeting with the uh, GEDCOM uh, project, the Genealogical Data Communications. And uh, our uh, first effort was the release of GEDCOM 7.0. So this kind of ongoing relationship of, of supplying information in bulk to family search is going on by <clears throat> hundreds and thousands of people. Um, and that's why <clears throat> these, the whole idea here of the website is so wonderful. So today, the, the research wiki has just over 100,000 articles. So from the, from the uh, start of 800 articles, which were essentially a copy of what was known as the white books uh, that were the research guides that had been published by uh, I'm not sure exactly who published them the first, whatever organization was handling them at that time. And those white books, by the way, are available digitized on uh, the BYU website. Um, so you can go to the BYU catalog and look up the, the, those original digitized records. So from 2009 to 2012, the startup page didn't pay, change, but this is the page that it, it, it had evolved into. And you can see that there's research help, there's indexed records, and there's um, all sorts of, of startup pages here. Uh, so at this time, the family search 
org website was mainly a reference site. It's a place where you went to do some research and uh, you used a program like the personal ancestral file to enter your information and you stored it locally. And then um, on in 2009, on about February 3rd, uh, there was a program introduced called new.familysearch.org. This was the concept of putting a, a combined family tree where uh, you took information from all of from all individuals and put it into one database uh, in the form of a family tree. So this was released and it began uh, to be released in a beta stage and it never got out of the beta stage actually. And it was introduced in uh, geographic areas starting by uh, in Florida and then in uh, later into Mesa. And so little bit areas were given the new dot family search. There was a lot of discussion about it. Um, uh, without going into the big history of it, let's just call it the big disaster. Uh, it was uh, the problem with it is it was cumulative without the ability to make any corrections or changes. And that just created uh, massive, massive amounts of duplication. Uh, and there was no way to merge records. You just kept, if, if 800 of my relatives has happened, added the same record for my great grandfather, there were 800 copies in there. And it was, it was just, uh, and they were all varied in different, uh, and had different dates and all stuff. It was just almost impossible. And um, it kind of died of its own weight. So eventually, uh, and all of these, this is where all of those records got into uh, the stream on family search from the ones that I've mentioned, the ancestral file, the IGI, the PRF, the church membership records and the temple records. That's where it all came in to be. And then in 2011, uh, they re the whole website was redesigned. Uh, this is basically when you, when you begin to understand this, and this is only like, uh, now we're going on what, 12 years, 11 years, uh, 11 years ago. Um, that, let only you'll only search one database at the time and then you could start for the first time you could start uh statewide searches of multiple databases and it included a bunch of databases and the big thing they began the digitizing of the indexed microfilms so only about the last 10 years have we had any of this of what we take for granted today on the big websites this is the, this is barely, uh, barely out of grade school kind of level. And if you're, if you get frustrated with the family search website or you get frustrated with the family tree, just think about having to deal with a bunch of kids in junior high school. Well, I don't mean the people on family search or in junior high school, but the same level of, of development. In other words, it, we don't have years and years and years of experience. It's, it's, a, it's all new and everything that's being done is new. And so we have to kind of be a little more tolerant of the problems that occurred. Now, guess what? Roots Tech. Roots Tech came along. Um, and why is this such, why was this a big deal? Well, first of all, Roots Tech gathered together uh, a, a number of different conferences that had been held. And, uh, and it was just a monumental, effort by family search to move the whole concept of genealogy into a mainstream kind of of, uh, of area and in interest and here's uh, where my introduction was to uh, roots tech was back then at the first roots tech and there were uh, 16 genealogy bloggers who had been writing um, in my uh, genealogy star blog. And so we were invited and we were kind of honored guests. Uh, we got uh, tours and just a lot of handout things and uh, dinners and all sorts of things. It was, uh, it was a major uh, kind of uh, event. Now, why were these people chosen and what happened here? Well, this was, this was when, 
uh, on the internet, genealogy bloggers was the big thing. Uh, pre days pre social networking. Uh, this was a time when people went to the blogs to get information, and uh, they still do, but not as much as they did back then. And so, basically, these people were the were the uh, outlet, the news outlet for uh, all of the things having to do with genealogy. And uh, this group of people over the years, um, I continue to have contact with many of these people in sort of an online contacting way. Uh, now they're all retiring. In fact, uh, the one dear Myrtle, who's Pat Richley Erickson, uh, just retired this past week or so. And they're all kind of getting old, uh, most of them are kind of are still around, but they're uh, they're they've gone into different things, or they've not stopped blogging, or whatever. But there's a few holdouts. There's uh, uh, Randy Seaver and I, and uh, uh, some of the others have still online. Lisa Cook is very much online, and most of us, by the way, have have moved from being totally emphasized on a written blog to being almost entirely involved in, uh, in video and online classes and other things. Um, right now, uh, we've, I'm averaging about one or two or three videos a week. So that's gonna be the major part of, where, part of what we do. 2012, uh, there was another big uh, change. Of course, there was still a, uh, there were up to 17 conference bloggers. Uh, and as uh, kind of an interest up till the present time, I have served as an official blogger, ambassador, or influencer in every single one of the Refit Rootstex conferences so far. So here we are. Um, we have people talking. Um, and uh, this is it. I mean, this is the, the uh, promotional material. Well, after the fact, the, in the research wiki of the information. but. Uh, the promotional was very low key and the numbers were fairly small. The first uh, Roots Tech conference had about 3,000 uh, attendees. So now uh, we're up to 2012. Uh, we have a new, completely different design of, uh, of Family Search website. And uh, you've got a lot of information uh, under the cover here. Uh, you'll recognize the map, <laughs> and uh, if you go to the to the historical records collection and and even the newest iterations, uh, the map's not as uh, prominent as it used to be. And then uh, we're up to 2013, and that was an interesting one. Um, here on the on the uh, history, they they list that. Uh, uh, one of the keynote speakers on Saturday was Gilad Jepeth, who is the founder and CEO of MyHeritage. Well, what happened in 2013 was that uh, MyHeritage, um, uh, the, the Gilad could not attend because of the death in the family, and I was asked to be their keynote speaker. So that was kind of interesting, and it's our, my connections to MyHeritage have remained Okay, we're going to kind of move fast here because these are more more commonly. Uh, so in 2014, there were only 3,000, and and then there's really no changes from 2014 to 2018. All during this time, there were more and more records being added. You might recognize some of the the keynotes and other people from uh, from this early time in the six in 2016. And all of these, uh, all of this information is coming from the Internet Archive, from archive.org and the Wayback Machine. And then uh, you'll see some more uh, that happened. Uh, uh, Roots Tech began to get larger and larger, and uh, ultimately, uh, the uh, attendance was up to around between twenty and thirty thousand people, uh, which was not the capacity of the Salt Palace in Salt Lake City where the conferences were being held, but it was uh, a, a major conference. And finally, uh, we get 
the the familiar face from uh, in 2018 that has been uh, that's been on there on the website in 2018. And you'll see that the that Family Search has gone from uh, kind of a, a text based uh, website to uh, the minim minimalist uh, Google kind of uh, give you one choice or one thing or three things to do on the website at this time. Now we have 2019, which was the last, um, uh, was next to the last one that, that we, that before the pandemic. And then we hit to Roots Tech London, which was supposed to be a big conference. Uh, they held one and then the next one was canceled. And of course, we had the big change in 2020. Um, what happened is that Roots Tech was from February 26th to the 29th, and you'll recognize that everything shut down in March. So this was the last in-person big conference that we had. And then in, uh, they redid the, the website again in 2020, and this is beginning to look almost exactly like we have today. And then we, it went online, and the big news at that time was that the, uh, that rather than 20 or 30,000 people, there were over a million and a half people who uh, got on the website or were involved. And then in 2022, which we just had recently, we had millions, millions and millions of attendees and uh, typo there should be of and the numbers have still not been released however through the grapevine uh, the numbers are in the multi uh, tens of millions of people were uh, tuned in to at least part of uh, the website and that continues uh, it turns out to be a fabulous resource there are thousands of of uh, records of uh, videos that are archived and, and presented and still available. Uh, you still need to create account. You still need to have familysearch.org account. But when you get in, you can uh, you can be, look at all that information uh, for free and online. It's just uh, the archive here that they have of thousands of videos is uh, is phenomenal. Okay, we'd like to thanks the Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine for these photos and this kind of insight into the, uh, into the development of the FamilySearch.org website. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Oh, by the way, if anybody's been wondering, all the photos I use at the end of my, of my presentations are my own photographs. Okay, questions?